Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you first for inviting me here today, and thank you to Lisa too um, for the really nice introduction. So, um, a bit of context. So, I'm Holly Goodyear, and I am responsible for um, the Future Media Audience Team at the BBC, um, and that comprises of three distinct disciplines. So, that's traditional research, it's analytics, um, and it's also uh, strategic planning, um, my discipline, which is essentially working with content makers, producers to apply insight and help us make great things for our audiences. Um, so with that, the great um, privilege that we have um, is day-to-day -day working with people across the BBC to try and help make brilliant programmes, websites and experiences for our licence fee payers. Um, and that takes up pretty much most of our time. Um, but every now and again we allow ourselves a little bit of a step back um, to try and do some research and thinking that helps us frame the landscape and guide some of our, our bigger strategic initiatives and that's what we're going to share with you today. Um, the work's called The Participation Choice. Um, it's some work that we did um, last year um, to try and understand how is the UK online population participating today or not, as the case may be. Um, so, a little bit of context. So um, for many of you in the room, you'll know that digital participation is a vast and unwieldy area. It could and does mean lots of different things. Um, so for the purpose of this work, we defined it in this particular way. Um, essentially, we mean creating and contributing online so others can see. So within this, there's, there are two poles, so creating and contributing. So that can be everything from as broad as to anyone in the world. Um, it could be as small as just intimate friend groups. Um, uh, it could be as involved as um, creating your own site or blogging. It could be as light as liking via Facebook. So vast range of activity, real range of types of groups of people that we're interested in. Um, but we did this work to try and, and develop for ourselves and for the wider industry a new model, a model that would help us articulate how the UK online population um, does create and contribute today. Um, and there were some things in there that were really surprising, some quite reassuring and a little bit startling too. Um, so. Without further ado, the, the main insight for us, um, for me personally, was, was less surprising, um, but surprising and um, perhaps for some of the partners that we work with, um, which is asking the question, how active really is the UK online population today? And well over three quarters of the UK online population um, are indeed active. It's worth noting um, from a methodological point of view, this was a huge study, so we surveyed um, 7,000 people um, nationally represented online um, also did lots of interviews and core research also the, the vast majority of this um, that we'll share with you today is quantitative with a little bit of flickers of the core work as well so what we're able to establish is um, essentially that online uh, participation is one is really uh, a very mainstream activity for the UK online population today um, and what was interesting, as Lisa's alluded to, is this is a really, really different picture to that which has um, guided much of our thinking, the BBC and the industry alike, um, since 2006, and that's the 1990% rule. So who in this room, show of hands, is familiar with the 1990% rule? Okay, so I'll um, explain a little bit. So it was coined back in 2006, and it was a, a certain type of participation um, that it was it was particularly exploring, which was um, participation within online communities. And this work, lots of different people credit themselves of, of developing it, but who, whoever it was, um, essentially this helped us acknowledge that even though um, digital media has given us lots of tools and techniques and ability to be active online, um, not many people actually were. So this is back in 2006, and the work stated that um, in an online community, around 1% of that community are really deeply active. So they're the ones who would be doing lots of different types of activity um, to a great degree. Um, the further 9% were then a little bit more active, um, but not hugely so. The big insight was that um, it was actually a whopping majority, a whopping 90% of people within online communities were passive, simply voyeuristically enjoying the spoils of the activity of that 10%. 
Now, that work has been incredibly helpful um, for us and the industry alike, one in, in determining how we invest in digital media, but also thinking about the types of experiences we would create for audiences. Um, really simply that not everyone is going to be heavily active online just because they can. Um, and indeed, there is great pleasure and benefit for voyeuristically enjoying the spoils of other people's activity. Um, so while really helpful, we, we, we sort of step back and look, gosh, the book, little rumble in our stomachs that, that arguably the world has changed an awful lot since 2006 and while this model is really helpful um, we needed something slightly different to guide our thinking at the BBC and for the wider industry. One only because the, the landscape has changed but also for us at the BBC we're not just interested in online community but as we have a responsibility to all license fee payers, we're interested in building a picture of the whole online universe, not just those um, in online communities. So it became really clear through this big analysis that we did that the picture that we were painting was markedly different to that one nine ninety percent rule. So rather than us saying only 10% of people are active, a 70 77% of the online population today are active in some way and I'm going to explain a little bit more about that because um, for me this bit was not so surprising um, for lots of really obvious reasons. So one, the internet has changed massively since 2006. Um, first, penetration, and we're now almost at 80% um, of, the, of the UK population are now online. <coughs> also the devices, bless you, um, that we have. Um, I were joking earlier, I'm carrying around with me four different Apple devices today. Um, for the BBC, we've been investing a lot more in, in um, helping and enabling audiences to access and benefit from the internet on various different screens, whether that be via desktop, mobile, IPTV, um, or, or tablets. Um, also products, so back in 2006, Facebook and Twitter were still relatively nascent, can you imagine that? Um, also, you know, Pinterest, inter Instagram were just kind of twinkles in people's eyes, so the world has changed an awful lot. Um, and that we found in all of our research, the influence of cultural norms. Um, I, I rarely admit this, but I feel we, I've admitted it over lunch and I should admit it to this group too. Um, the, the point of cultural norm, so it is, we find more and more people that we speak to, it's slightly uncomfortable socially to be online and not part of a social network these days. Um, I've worked in digital and traditional media for a really long time, but I'm not on Facebook. Um, and that makes me feel quite uncomfortable um, expressing it to this group. As a digital expert, arguably I should be spending a lot of time on Facebook but I do it do it warmly to show the pressure that I personally feel about, about being in this profession and needing to be part of this type of activity as a gentle nod to what it feels like for lots of the people we speak to in their working lives if you aren't in LinkedIn or whatever that might be in your home and, and personal lives if you're not in other networks too so it's not just about ability and capability it's about the pressure that we may feel in, in our social professional and personal lives. So if that 77% is perhaps not that surprising, the thing that did surprise me was the other end of the spectrum. So we found with all of those changes, we still have just under a quarter of the online population are still passive. Bear in mind by passive, we're meaning not doing, it's even as, as light as not doing likes via Facebook. It's, this passive is about not doing some things that you would consider really, really simple and mainstream activity. So why? in this changing landscape, uh, just under a quarter of the population still relatively passive. Um, well, through this we, we challenged ourselves to say what are the drivers of this? Because normally one of the drivers we would ask, and we know that the, um, this, the Oxford Internet Institute is particularly good um, in this particular area of expertise, was digital literacy. <coughs> Um, and we found that, well, of course, this is a survey and big piece of research for people who are already online. So digital literacy in that regard was not the driving factor behind this, this passivity. We also found that there was nothing remarkable about this group in terms of age, gender or social class. All walks of life were in this group too. Um, and also really interestingly, albeit a small percentage, 11% of that 23 were what we would class as early adopters. Um, so 
even in this group of people, we still have people who consider themselves at the cutting edge of technology use and adoption, choosing um, to be passive online. And choice being the operative word, so I'll come on to that. Um, because the thing that we loved about this study, um, in our world we love our data, um, but we believe that um, imbuing that with a sense of humanity and life and uh, and qualitative insight is really important too. Um, so when we started digging a little bit more into the reasons why, it became a very, very human story, quite hearteningly for us. Um, because while all of these people have the ability, skill, and access to participate online, they were simply choosing not to. Um, why are they choosing not to? Uh, one, they just, I just don't see what's in it for me. The benefit was really not there. Also that they felt that it was perhaps not how they wanted to be identified, either um, in their lives or to the wider world. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the people we met um, in a second. Um, but the question for us more broadly is what's going to happen to this group? So if we've seen, of course, the models aren't directly comparable, but that shift from 2006 and the 1990% rule to this type of story in 2012, what's going to happen to this group um, um, if we went back, if we go back in six years' time and say, will there still be a quarter of the online population is still passive? Will it grow? Will it shrink? It's something when we've spoken to our, our colleagues at Facebook and Google that they've been particularly interested in, the question whether will this group actually, will we see more rejection of this type of activity? Will this be a niche group or actually will all of the online population become active? Um, we don't know the answer, of course, but an interesting question to ponder. Um, but we're also aware, and we're really keen to make sure that we can tell this very broad story, but also that we can delve into a bit more detail and make it really actionable too. Um, and these two chunks are very big groups of people, so we, we broke it down a little bit more. So if we're looking first at the active group, um, akin to the 1990% rule, we found within that 77%, there's still a more active group of people. We call them the intense participators. So 17% of the UK online population, we would class as intense participators online. So we want to characterize them. So um, yes, this group are a little bit more likely to be younger. Um, and they also are a little bit more likely to be early adopters, but not hugely so. So if you remember back to the passive group, 11% of that passive group were early adopters, it's just 20% um, early adopters in this intense group. And again, the things that really define them are their characteristics, uh, their, the way they see the world. Um, so these people do tend to be uh, more passionate about the internet, more active online. So they will use the broadest range of services and be more curious about new types of technologies and features. Um, but pivotally, the thing that, that defines them is their need and desire for expression, um, their confidence in their opinions and their desire to be heard. These people are creating and contributing online because they feel like they have something to say, something that they feel really passionate about, something <coughs> they want to be able to share with the wider world. And the same question goes for this group um, as, as goes for the passive group. We're interested in how this is likely to evolve over time. Will we see this group grow as more people become digitally literate or actually are we just describing a type of person, and so arguably they, that, that group um, may stay a similar proportion over years to come. Um, so we've got two really familiar polls, the super active or the high participators online, and the ones who, who voyeuristically enjoy the spoils of everyone else's activity. Um, but the thing that we found is perhaps the most interesting change is the rise of what we're calling easy participation. So. Easy participation for us describes the big shift in capability over the last six years, which is driven by the rise of Facebook, Flickr, Twitter, Pinterest. So the idea for me six years ago of wanting to share photographs with my friends online would require a different level of technical skill and a greater um, desire and amount of time for me to be able to do that. Whereas now, just do that simply via Flickr or Facebook or Twitter or whatever it might be. It just feels like everyday kind of light interaction. 
Um, indeed, now as we talked about that, the idea that you are not connecting with your family around the wide world, or that you're not um, managing your identity or your skills in your professional arena, is something that people will feel kind of the cultural pressure of. Um, but something that Facebook articulated really nicely, um, the, the idea of participation now being somewhat more frictionless. So essentially to participate online six years ago um, was a big choice, um, whereas now to participate online is, is a much lighter, lighter choice. Um, I won't labour these two. We did break down easy participation into, into two other groups. Um, as the title suggests, there's the initiators and the reactors. Um, so the initiators are the largest group, and these do tend to be slightly younger, um, but with a female skew, um, because the things that really spark their participation are things about people and lives. So it tends to be about friends and family, the type of conversation you would experience via Facebook. Um, also about the trading of photos. Um, you can see why Facebook um, wisely um, invests in Instagram as a, as a result of that. But also, interestingly for us at the BBC and media organisations, um, this group of people tend to be particularly bound in terms of media around television, around big entertainment um, and lifestyle format. So that might be a th uh, gardening shows or health, things that, would, that, that are about everyday and very personal life. Um, the last group uh, tend to be a bit older and they have less devices. They do participate online, but won't be the ones who start the participation. So it tends to be in reaction to activity from either one of these two groups. Um, so if that's the model, I'd like to talk uh, a f through a few broader themes that we saw um, through the research before I close. Um, so. For us at the BBC, and like, like many others, we were interested in seeing whether this is a model that, that people would, would evolve through. Would they step from being passive to easy to intense? So we question what the BBC's role should be in this. Should we be trying to help all of the UK on your online population to become intense participators? Um, the short answer to that is we believe no. Um, partly about our role, but partly about um, audience desire in this space. The more that you speak with audiences about digital participation, it's not something that that many people either when questioned or probed um, would say, I really want to get good at digital participation. It's not something that people sought or desired. Um, also recognising that um, each of these different parts of the spectrum are valid and valuable in their own right. So important to make sure that we, we continue to support a, an ecosystem of uh, participatory behaviour. Um, the second also, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, as many do when we talk through this presentation, you're thinking, but where am I on this spectrum? Um, well, each of you, um, and I, I think, one of the, the difficult and enlightening things about this is that this is not a universal um, segmentation. The recognition that I as an individual can be passive, easy or intense depending on the subject in question, the moment in my life, um, uh, the, the area that I'm particularly working on. So um, two examples of this. Um, a, uh, one of my really good friends at the time we did this research was running the London Marathon to his great credit. Um, and uh, he talked a, a lot to us about, <laughs> maybe a little too much. Um, uh, he um, also very happily set up his own, um, his own site for us to, to give generously to his cause. But what he didn't do was then set up a, a blog to share his experiences and take photos or do a big journal about it. So he was, even even though he is a, a, was a really very um, proficient digital media user, he was choosing to stay in the relatively easy part of this spectrum. Um, but the thing, uh, one of the people that we love that we met was a guy, uh, we're calling Peter to preserve his anonymity. And um, he was an accountant um, and a father of two uh, teenage girls. And in his um, home and professional life, he was not a digital participator at all. Pretty much passive, didn't see the point of it, didn't want to fit it into his daily life. It was a hassle, not really bothered, you know, didn't really hit there. Um, but the minute you started talking to you about music, you were in a completely different place. So uh, he was a massive fan of a band called Y&T. 
if anyone knows them, um, it's like a prog rock band in the 60s, 70s. Um, and the minute you started talking to him about this, his eyes lit up. He was a completely different person in terms of his digital participation. He um, filmed gigs and uploaded them online. He um, set up and managed fan groups. He uh, made friends online that became then friends in his real world and life. Um, his passion made him an intense participator. And it is this passion, these trigger points that we at the BBC are interested in and why we called this the model of participation choice. Because we're interested in whether it's the Arab Spring, whether it's Y&T, whether it's parenting, um, understanding, recognising and enabling people's trigger points that help them choose to change their online behaviour or at least exert um, uh, or use the skills that they have around uh, a digital participation. So we believe that participation, the participation choice is um, not universal, it's something that's inspired in people. Um, and as I draw towards close, um, it would be really remiss of me to, to not talk about some of the negative things that we found we spoke with people about digital participation, um, because um, people's uh, perception of, of this capability and what it means for their lives is not all good. Um, we're all really familiar with concerns about uh, privacy online, um, but lots of people were also concerned about the amount of time that they were dedicating to it. Um, the more time you spend, you're like, oh my god, I spent hours and hours and hours on Facebook. Or um, I realised that um, yeah, my Twitter time is X, or I realised whatever, whatever the, the, the root of their participation may be, just how much this was the fabric of, of their lives and, and what that means for how they would engage with society, what that would mean for their identity as they grow older, what it would mean for shifting jobs and lives etc. So um, there's recognising that there's, there's both great liberating things through online participation but lots of concerns for people too um, and need to be mindful of that um, when we're managing and helping influence people's behaviour. Um, but one of the things that the BBC that we're interested in um, and uh, if I say this lightly is um, say this the quality of people's online participation so making sure that it is rich and rewarding um, uh, and, and high value um, uh, an experiment that we did a while ago actually when uh, at least was at the BBC was in um, uh, arts uh, I'm working with uh, Mark Mould who's um, particular interest is in film and he uh, we started the blog with Mark and um, off the back of his blog audiences are invited to comment on, on various different subjects that he talks about in every given day or week. Um, and we found that the conversation that came off the back of that um, brought with it some of the challenges that audiences raised through this research was that sometimes it can be bilious, sometimes it's, of, it's not well thought through, sometimes it's, it's combative. Um, so we thought well what's the BBC's role in this dialogue and how might we shape it or enrich it? Um, so we thought we'll do a little experiment to say, well, what, what happens if we put Mark into the dialogue? What if we make him part of that conversation? And very warmly, he said yes. Um, and so Mark started responding to the comments and, and um, conversation that was happening on the blog. And you've never seen a conversation turn around so fast. Suddenly everyone was talking very earnestly about the nature of film <laughs> and what it all meant for, uh, for the BBC and our, our coverage of it. But it's an interesting question, as we say, we believe that participation can and is a wonderful enriching thing for society as a whole. It brings with it great concerns that we need to be uh, very mindful of um, but also at the same time wondering what our various different roles may be in making sure that we make this a both safe and, uh, and, and wonderful rewarding um, benefit in UK society today. Um, so last but not least um, what would sum up our question about what the BBC's role should be in terms of digital participation? Um, and I suppose that's expressed by us questioning what we think the landscape will be like in another six years' time. So if we came back again, would this change? Um, yes, it may change. We might see more passive. Easy might have broken down in lots of different ways. Intense may have grown slightly. 
But the one thing that we can be certain of is that there will always be a spectrum of participation. There will always be people and activities around which people choose to be incredibly vocal, inclusively be quite quiet. That spectrum is one that the BBC, we believe we need to honour and support. So however the landscape changes, we need to make it sure possible for participation to be rewarding for everyone online, wherever they may be on the spectrum. Thank you. First off, is this available? Yeah, so the, it's on the BBC Internet blog. Yeah. Um, so my question is really, the BBC website is on the internet, mm -hmm. and the internet is largely accessible across the world now. Yeah. So to what extent are you sort of designing the content and the website mm -hmm. to the international audience as opposed to just the UK? Yeah, so um, there's a, a light and simple answer to that. So um, the BBC um, is a majority funded by the UK licence fee payer. So the majority of our effort is focused on serving the UK audience. But of course we have Global News and the World Service. Um, and through, through those groups we are much more sensitive to the worldwide audience. And very happily the, those groups have been really interested in leveraging some of these insights too. Okay. Thank you. Hi, is it class? Um, you, it, so your survey uh, focuses on, on, the, on the active uh, participants mm -hmm. who, who are actually active, or who, are, who, are, sorry, uh, who are on the internet, mm -hmm. but out of the general population, how big a percentage is that? So uh, I think the UK um, online penetration now is about 80%, I think. Okay, yeah. fine. Okay. Thanks. So, um, I mean, you're talking about different types of participation, different levels of... Yeah. And to what extent do you feel as the BBC that you're trying to influence cultural norms in a mm. particular direction? And to what extent do you see yourselves as following? Gosh, that's a really good question. Um, our as ever, because we're trying to serve everyone, we have a responsibility to do both of those things. Um, and both of those things are through the lens of making sure that we deliver our public purposes. So how the degree to which we help people be informed, educated and entertained. So um, I would argue that the majority of our activity is about making sure that audiences can benefit from cultural norms established by the wider internet, but also we're trying to make sure that we build digital literacy too. So hence investments say in uh, services like BBC iPlayer, where that activity, that um, consumption of video on demand via the internet was relatively nascent when we placed that investment, but was there to try and enable both the market and, and license fee payers. But I mean, in terms of the easy bit yeah. in the middle, how does like something equate with entertain, I can never remember the week, entertain, <laughs> whatever that is. It's all magic and entertain, yeah. yeah. uh, because, because, you know, it, I mean, how do you, do, do you see that easy participation as having an impact? Yes, really so. So I, I cast it in a different way. So one of the questions before would have been, do we only care about intense? And do we only care about passive? So very polarised conversation. So how do we serve those really active people online, also being mindful that, that others may, may just want to voyeuristically enjoy the spoils? And um, what we're saying here is that actually mainstream activity online involves um, much more activity now than we ever have done before. So it's really important that as the BBC we help um, serve and engage very active, passionate groups while also making it really possible for people who are much more likely involved or engaged online to benefit too. So that could be as simple as saying uh, comic relief on Friday. How do we make sure that really active, engaged groups can fundraise and get involved? But also, how do we make sure that people like my mum can vote easily um, or can uh, uh, can follow particular groups? Does that help? Um, it's excellent work. I have a comment and a question. Comment. I'm a bit uncomfortable with this voyeuristic enjoyment of the spoils of others' work. I'm very uncomfortable with the idea that that implies a spectrum from good to bad. Yeah. If we renamed your three categories, people who read and learn, 
people who talk and people who shout, <laughs> um, you might feel more comfortable with the left, which is quite a valid uh, yeah, behaviour. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it a bit negative. Yes, My question was, um, I wonder how you map these various segmentations you've done mm. onto the sort of uh, circle within which people participate. So yeah. people may be very comfortable and very active with their friends on Facebook, it does not mean they want to join all the yes. nutters at the bottom of the newspaper article. Again, I think, they're really confrontational. <laughs> How do you map those dimensions of privacy, of what, you know, what they're comfortable with? Yeah, so uh, one, I enjoyed your provocation, thank you. Um, uh, so I think one clarification on the first point, um, there's no value judgment mm. on the spectrum. So uh, voyeuristically enjoy the spoils. Or, and I could also say that I, uh, I count as passive. So sh mm. um, so you're saying all of those things are really important. Um, then if, I, if I'm hearing you right, the question then about how do we make sure that we, we leverage this um, depending on leverage it towards various different interest groups. Is that the right, yeah. would that be the right yeah, reading? People behave on that spectrum one way if they're in a small family group, yes. another way if they're in the wide world. How do you relate those two together? Does someone tend to behave the same way in both? Or? Um, so the activity varies um, absolutely by type of, type of interactions and who they're with and uh, kind of wider world. But so much of them varied by type of person they were. So some people are on shout, whichever group they're in, um, if, I, if I may borrow that language. Um, but also the BBC, that's when we get really specific about development. So we would say, right, OK, so how do we, let's take comic relief again, how do we take this particular subject and make sure that it is rewarding for people who want to talk about this in very intimate groups, people who want to then uh, talk a little bit wider, who, which might be then intimate plus, and then how do we make sure it's valuable then for people who are on full shout mode? But we get very specific after that. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Um, when you design things, do you design to kind of um fit the audience that you're seeing or do you design to change that? So when you're briefing a new site or something, do you say this is our audience, this is the likely way they behave or do you design in a way that can change that because the BBC can clearly influence mm. that behaviour? Gosh, that's a really good question. Um, uh, so what we do is design for audience need first and foremost. Um, so, so we would say we believe that, I don't know, we're going to uh, cover cover the election and for the election we're going to cover it for these particular audience groups and their needs within that are X, Y and Z. I would say then wanting to change behaviour is, is, a, is a smaller subset of what we're trying to do probably in the main, is we're wanting to try and enable and empower existing behaviours. Um, or if we are trying to change behaviours, we're trying to change behaviours so they can benefit more from the BBC or, or become more literate. I Hey. Oh, good question. Um, uh, so Daniel Danker, who heads up iFlyer, will uh, warmly uh, forgive me saying this. The, the journey that we've gone on with iPlayer has been first starting off very much in early adopter. Um, so as we said before, it was a it was certainly not mainstream behaviour when we we conceived it all those years ago. Um, our focus now is actually making iPlayer really beneficial for mainstream audiences, um, and so that. And it's, and it's heart has a real challenge because how do we make it still really valuable for the early adopters who are more active and more complex in their use and engagement with programs online but how also do we make it really rewarding for my mom and grandma and all those people who for now television can be uh, not just something that's delivered via their linear schedule but a destination online um, so we're absolutely aiming to make iPlayer more and more of a mainstream destination Destination, so for the, the easier group, but while still making sure it's rewarding for, for the, the slightly more active portion of the population. Can, can I just ask a quick follow-up question? How does that affect your competitors? Will it, it will invariably impact on your competitors. Uh, I would say, well, I don't know the answer to that. I would say that um, we're really keen to make sure that we stimulate and enable the industry. So we very actively partner with our competitors, the BBC wouldn't say that, but um, uh, the wider market um, to share our learning and insight and direction that, that, that we're going into. Okay. Sorry, just, one, one one. One. This is just a really an out of interest question, um, hmm. but do you have any policy or at least a, a procedure for which specific online services you sort of 
assimilate into your pages. So I noticed Facebook and Twitter are quite big mm. in the wider world, but also on the BBC. And um, I think Twitter came in quite early on the BBC's kind of integration. Yeah. But also it is unique. But that's it's Alex. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, sure. <laughs> Do you want to take Alex or not? Um, oh, she's gone now. Can we make them back? Yes. Yeah. So I'm. I'm actually probably not going to be the best equipped to answer the question. Forgive me. Um, I think we've, the the most honest answer is that the BBC has a really considered fair trading policy to make sure that um, we uh, support and enable the wider market in its in its broader sense. So those decisions likely are based on market size, but also making sure that we don't just support the biggest competitors out there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone.